Good morning and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut, my first episode actually since I have returned to the United States. Very glad to be back to be meeting with my son um, for our last holiday season to be spent together before he goes off to university. Very important thing to me. And also, something that's incredibly important, is the 20 million view milestone that we just hit and we have a special video for you to commemorate this. And this video is a little unusual. It's not something I cover a great deal, but I have a great deal of passion for it. And because it's a subject that makes me very, very angry. And that's the fact that we have received quite a number of extraterrestrial signals that have up to this point still defied explanation over the years. The only thing they haven't done is repeat, which is one thing that SETI requires if a signal is to be regarded as genuine. But other than that, there have been a a number of signals, as I say, of defied explanation, still are at least theoretically valid signals, one of which, of course, was the WOW signal back in 1977, and that's the only one that you're ever really going to find. The other ones have been debunked since then, although, as I said, there are quite a number that have not, including one that I call a new WOW signal that we picked up only a few years ago, and it puts the original WOW signal to shame, unbelievably powerful and coming from right in our neighborhood, which is a bit unsettling to say the least. And yet, does it get any sort of attention whatsoever? No, because it did not repeat. But is that the only requirement? Does, does an alien civilization even need to know that their signals need to repeat in order to get our attention? Because this particular signal was unbelievably powerful and at exactly the right frequency that we would expect for a civilization trying to get our attention to send. So what is it about it that we still don't regard as being legitimate enough to at least report on it? And more importantly, the new initiative being taken by the Breakthrough Listen plan, and for those of you who are not familiar with that, it's a plan to listen a lot more regularly and with a lot more sustained dish time than we've done in the past with SETI in order to see whether or not these signals actually do repeat. Because it's not like we listen to these things 24-7 for years on end. We don't. These signals could have repeated at some point and we just haven't heard them. Now, for the first time, we're going to be listening for a long period of time to see whether or not we find that magic bullet, that strong repeating signal that defies natural explanation. And we could have our answer as to whether or not we're alone in the universe very soon. And I'm going to tell you all about that in just a moment. This is the main dish at the National Space Center in Ireland. It doesn't function, and I have to admit it broke my heart when I found that out, especially considering that it would require only about 5 million euros to get it up and running. So one of the first questions that I asked them while I was visiting the National Space Center is why not ask SETI to go ahead and renovate this for them? The answer was SETI doesn't have the money, and neither does Breakthrough Listen. That came as a tremendous shock to me. The initiative that is the most determined to find extraterrestrial signals and evidence of civilizations beyond our own receives less funding than the average parking ticket for Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. 
But is it really worth investing millions of euros in getting a radio dish operable just for the purpose of looking for extraterrestrial signals, given the fact that we really haven't detected anything in spite of all of this listening over all of these decades? Well, this is such a flawed argument for so many different reasons. First of all, we haven't been listening nonstop. Secondly, we certainly haven't been listening to the entire sky nonstop. We've really dedicated very little time and very little equipment to detecting extraterrestrial signals. And in spite of this, in spite of the fact that we really haven't been spending a great deal of time or a great deal of money on detecting these incredibly important signals, we have actually still picked up quite a number of them that have so far defied natural explanation and get very, very little coverage in the media. The first of these is SHG B02 plus 14A. Yeah, get used to it. There's going to be a lot of signals with this kind of coding. But in any event, this signal was detected some time ago and it didn't really fall into all of the perfect categories that SETI regards as for an extraterrestrial terrestrial signal. First of all, it was very weak, and second of all, it didn't appear to be coming from any star system. It was coming from a direction between the constellations Pisces and Aries, a direction where there are no observable stars within a thousand light years. As I said, it's a weak signal, but it was transmitting at the right frequency, about 1420 megahertz, which is the frequency that corresponds with hydrogen, the most common substance in the universe, and of course something that we would assume that a civilization trying to use commonly understood concepts would send to us, a frequency that is associated with hydrogen. So it fit in a number of ways, but there was also another problem. The red shifting of the signal suggested that it was coming from an object that was spinning at a rate that was 40 times greater than the Earth rotates on its axis. That of course would be impossible if it was coming from a planet. So given the fact that there was no stellar system in the area and it was coming from an object that was rotating faster than any planet, SETI dismissed it even though the signal repeated at least two more times. This seems to be a very narrow-minded approach because if it was an advanced civilization, they could have been traveling interstellar, in which case it would have been a spaceship, not a planet, that could very well have been spinning at that rate in order to provide artificial gravity for its passengers. And of course, if it was traveling between the stars, it wouldn't have to come from a planet. Nevertheless, that wasn't enough proof. Not only that, it doesn't get any media attention. And this sort of signal is not, in fact, unusual. There was a particular project known as the Mega Channel Extraterrestrial Assay, also known as META, which was funded and spearheaded in part by Carl Sagan and even Steven Spielberg that picked up no less than 11 signals that once again defied natural explanation. These 11 signals had all the expected characteristics of a transmission from an extraterrestrial transmitter except that they did not repeat. The frequencies were right, they were narrow band transmissions, which is what we would expect, but nevertheless, they didn't repeat, and so therefore, they were largely discarded. And this is the sort of thing that happened a great deal during the time that SETI was in a much more active state of operation, was actually getting a little bit more funding. But none of these signals hold a candle to what we picked up in 2000. 2010. This signal is known as TYC 1220-91-1, which is actually a star, a solar twin a bit older than the sun, about a billion and a half years older, that is to say, than our sun, but still main sequence and about the same size as our sun, and yet the transmission was much, much more powerful and far more noticeable than the WOW signal, which by the way was a strong signal in its itself. It was 10 times as powerful as the WOW signal and is in fact one of the most powerful signals of any kind ever detected. And here are the various characteristics of this signal that make it so damn interesting. First of all, the frequency. It did not come in at the hydrogen line, but rather the hydrogen line times pi. 
almost precisely. Of course, pi is a number that has no resolution, so it can't be exactly that, but it was so close as to be almost beyond being a coincidence. Not only that, because of the strength of the signal, it's the equivalent of a civilization screaming from the rooftops, trying to get our attention. A beacon of sorts, or perhaps some kind of a warning. We'll get to that in a moment. So what you have here is one of the most compelling candidates for an extraterrestrial civilization that we have ever detected. It came in at the right frequency. It was narrow band. It was incredibly powerful. It was coming from a star very similar to our own and only about a hundred light years away. And here's something else. Given how powerful this signal was, if it was a large scale beacon, that is to say a transmitter that was sending out signals to a variety of different stars, it would have to be coming from a Kardashev level 2 civilization. That is to say, a civilization that had actually built a Dyson sphere or a Dyson swarm around their own star. Now, there's very little evidence of that from this particular sun, so it might have been a directed beacon. A beacon aimed right at us, trying to get our attention. Why? Well, that's difficult to speculate, but there are other things about this signal that make it look artificial. For example, the signal amplitude has what's called main frequency and side frequencies. The side frequencies are modulated in such a way as to make them symmetrical. That is to say, you have side frequencies on either side of the main frequency that look very symmetrical and very artificial. Again, another very compelling characteristic of this signal to make it look quite artificial. But here's the problem. It didn't repeat. That's the only problem, by the way. It didn't repeat. Now, if this were a directed beacon, it would require a lot less energy, but still substantially more than our civilization is capable of. We're talking about a Kardashev level one civilization or a civilization that has harnessed all of the solar energy that strikes their planet. A colossal amount of energy, but still theoretically within the capabilities of a civilization that developed around a star that's over a billion years older than our star is. So why the hell does this not get more media attention? Why aren't people talking about this at least as much as the wow signal, given how amazingly compelling it is? Well, I'm going to get to that in a moment, but fortunately, somebody is finally going to be targeting this star again and many others, and that is the Breakthrough Listen initiative. Now, they have been listening since 2016, but with a very limited number of telescopes. That's about to change they're about to get full access to the Meerkat Telescope, which is an array of 64 individual dishes in South Africa, currently the largest radio telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. Meerkat will drastically improve the number of targets that Breakthrough Listen can analyze because the dishes can lock on to up to 64 different targets at once. According to Andrew Simeon, the principal investigator of Breakthrough Listen, quote, Meerkat can see an area of the sky 50 times bigger than the GBT can view at once. Breakthrough Listen will access a continuous data stream from Meerkat without interfering with scheduled astronomical research. Instead, data collected from other studies will be fed into a supercomputer, which uses a special algorithm to scan signals that it does not recognize as coming from known cosmic phenomena such as pulsars, stellar flares, or supernovas. And when a strange signal is detected, the researcher can then analyze the signal. This will give the researchers an opportunity to analyze this one very compelling signal from this interesting and nearby star to determine whether or not this signal actually does repeat and we just haven't been listening to it. But the question still remains, why has this compelling signal not received more attention? Well, there may be a very good reason. SETI and Breakthrough Listen and others may not want to alarm people. Because think about it for a moment. If a civilization that can harness all of the energy from the sunlight striking their planet is sending us a signal, why would they be doing that? Would they just be trying to get our attention because they want to say hello? Or are they trying to send us some kind of a warning? In a recent study, Dr. Avi 
Loeb analyzed what a Kardashev Level 1 civilization with a water-cooled structure approximately twice the size of our planet could be capable of, and the answer is a little unsettling. They could, in theory, accelerate a light sail with a mass of about a million tons to 50% of the speed of light. Which means, in theory, a hundred years ago, this civilization could have sent a vehicle with a payload of a million tons on its way towards our star system at 50% of the speed of light. They might have actually tried to warn us about it or perhaps demand our surrender, something along those lines. It's difficult, of course, to determine their motivations, but there's another possibility that's even more disturbing. Suppose a couple of centuries ago, when they would have been observing our planet and seeing industrial civilization just getting started on Earth that they decided that our planet and our civilization was not worth having around, that we might represent a threat in the future. Accelerating an object of even a few tons to 50% of the speed of light and sending it towards our planet would be a death sentence for our civilization. And perhaps a few years later, a well-intentioned government or somebody else in this civilization decides to warn us about it. There are many unsettling possibilities that are connected with a civilization this advanced and this close to our planet. Things that really we don't need to be getting people riled up about until we have absolutely conclusive proof that this signal came from another civilization. But now that Breakthrough Listen has access to such advanced technology and the ability to scan a thousand times as much space as they used to be able to, we could have an answer to this question very soon, and who knows what the future might hold once these truths come to light. We are now less than 9,000 subscribers away from that magic 100k. Please subscribe if you haven't already done so, and please tell your friends and family members to subscribe. You might spark a new interest in spaceflight. Also, please like this video. Thank you so much for watching watching, and as always, stay angry about space.